This is BBC News and these are the top stories developing at 11. A verdict is due in the next hour in the trial of a Danish inventor accused of murdering and dismembering Swedish journalist Kim Wahl on his submarine. The parents of seriously ill toddler Alfie Evans will challenge a high court ruling preventing him travelling to Italy for further treatment. The Brexit secretary says he expects Parliament to uphold the government's policy of leaving the customs union. Two men are arrested after violence outside Anfield before Liverpool's Champions League semi-final against Roma. A 53-year-old man remains in a critical condition. Also, after the Grenfell Tower fire, safety investigators say the system for fire testing cladding is inadequate and underestimates the ferocity and spread of real flames. And we talked to celebrity chef Hugh Fernley Whittingstall about his mission to change the eating habits of an entire city. Hello, a very good morning to you. It's Wednesday, the 25th of April. I'm Anita McVeigh and welcome to BBC Newsroom Live. In the next hour, a Danish court will deliver its verdict in the trial of a man accused of killing the journalist Kim Val. The 30-year-old Swedish reporter went missing after she was invited to interview the inventor Peter Madsen aboard his homemade submarine. Her dismembered remains were found at sea 11 days later in August last year. And let's speak now to our correspondent, Maddie Savage, who's in Copenhagen and has been following the trial. Uh, Maddie, perhaps you could remind us as we wait on the verdict of the cases outlined by the defence and the prosecution. Yes, at the centre of this case, Kim Val, a young journalist from Sweden who'd been hoping uh, to move to, de to uh, China with her Danish boyfriend, but just had this one story that she wanted to cover before that trip, interviewing Peter Madsen on his submarine. As we know, she did not come back from that journey alive. And during this trial, at seven weeks, the defence and prosecution have outlined wildly different versions of what they say happened on that night. Uh, prosecutors say that uh, Peter Madsen intended to kill Kim Val, that he brought a saw on board and that he killed her either by strangling her or by slitting her throat, presenting evidence that he'd viewed violent videos just in the hours before uh, Kim Val boarded in his submarine and had a lot of similar material uh, stored up. Uh, Peter Madsen has given three different versions of what he said happened. First, he said he dropped Kim Val off safely on dry land. Then he said she died uh, when a door hatch fell on her head. Uh, in court here in Copenhagen, he stuck to the third version of his story that she died after being consumed by toxic fumes when she got trapped on a different part of the submarine to her. He has admitted uh, dismembering her body uh, but denies killing her. And his uh, lawyers are focused on the fact that there is no forensic evidence to conclusively disprove his version of events. And Maddie, there's global media interest in this case, isn't there? A huge amount of global media interest. This is one of the most high-profile uh, murder trials in Scandinavian history, and crowds of journalists from around the world have turned up to cover uh, the story. The crews next to us from France, uh, Germany, Sweden, just to name uh, but a few. And waiting for that verdict, there are a number of different options that uh, that could come out here in court. He could be found uh, guilty of murder. The typical uh, sentence for that here, for this kind of crime, uh, could be life in prison, which would typically be about 16 years years in jail. Um, what his uh, lawyers, though, are arguing for is for a six-month sentence. Uh, they just want him to be found guilty of dismembering a body. There's also a third option, something here in Denmark called safe custody, uh, which means that even if the judge doesn't find him guilty of murder, if he believes Peter Madsen to be a danger to society, he could still be locked up indefinitely under the watch of doctors. OK, Maddie, thank you for that update. Maddie Savage in Copenhagen. Uh, we, of course, are waiting on that verdict to bring you news of it when it comes. Here, the parents of Alfie Evans, the seriously ill child who the courts have said should be allowed to die, are to challenge a ruling preventing them from taking him to Italy for further treatment. The 23-month-old's life support was withdrawn on Monday after a court decided the Alderhey Children's Hospital in Liverpool could end his 
end his care. A judge has since said his parents could take him home, but they want to move their son to a hospital in Rome. Alfie was first admitted to hospital in December 2016 when he was suffering seizures. He was just seven months old. Twelve months later, the hospital and Alfie's parents couldn't agree over his care. Older Hay applied to the High Court to remove ventilation and end parental rights. And in February this year, the High Court backed Older Hay and all subsequent appeals so far have failed. Earlier this month, protesters began to gather outside the hospital. Some are accused of abusing staff and intimidating other patients. And last week, Alfie's father met the Pope, who has pledged his support for the toddler to be treated in Rome. But the courts here have stood firm. On Monday night, Alfie's ventilation was withdrawn, and yesterday a High Court judge said he should end his life in a hospital, hospice or his home, but not abroad. With more on this, here's Keith Doyle. The parents of Alfie Evans have not given up their fight to have him moved out of the country for treatment, despite a High Court judge ruling against it, saying it was not in the toddler's best interests. Last night, following that ruling, Alfie's father, Tom, said that the 23-month-old was doing okay and the family have been allowed to appeal. We want to go to Italy. Everyone's ready. Alfie's ready. So now we, we, we see what the three judges in the Court of Appeal can do to us. And even if we don't achieve to get to Italy, then the judge is still offering us a chance to get home. Alfie has been in Alderhey since December 2016 with a rare degenerative neurological condition. Supporters of the child's family tried to storm the hospital on Monday, shortly before his life support was withdrawn when a court ruled doctors could end his care. His parents want him to be transferred to a hospital in Rome, a move which is supported by the Pope, whom Alfie's father, Tom, met last week. Last night, supporters of the family were outside the hospital. Inside, Alfie's parents stayed at the boy's side. The courts have said he should receive end-of-life care at the hospital or at a hospice or possibly at home. His parents say a plane is on standby to take him to Italy if the Court of Appeal rules in their favour this afternoon. Keith Doyle, BBC News. And let's talk now to our North of England correspondent, Judith Moritz, who's outside Alderhey Children's Hospital. Uh, Judith, a desperately sad case. What do Alfie's family say would be different about the treatment they believe he might be able to get in Italy compared to the treatment he's had there at Alderhey? Well, this has formed the crux of their argument uh, since the very beginning. They've always been saying that they wanted Alfie to be taken to the Bambino Jesu Hospital, which has links to the Vatican. They are a Catholic family uh, with strong beliefs, and they wanted Alfie to be treated there. Uh, it, it comes down to differences in the palliative care end-of-life treatment which Alfie is given, uh, and the fact that the family don't agree with Alder Hayes' analysis of the, the little boy's case, which is that he can't have uh, any hope of recovery, that uh, there is no more help that can be given to him. Now, as you saw in that report on uh, Monday night this week, uh, ventilation, the family tell us, the hospital haven't confirmed this, but the family told us on Monday night that ventilation had been removed from Alfie. The life support he's been on here for 18 months had been taken away, uh, but that since that point he has been breathing with the occasional assistance of, of just plain oxygen and with a few nutrients, which are part of the palliative plan here at the hospital. Now, that the family are saying that uh, Alfie is surpassing expectations in the fact that he is still alive, that he is coping with that minimal oxygen, and they say that is what gives them confidence now to approach the courts again to argue that it, that means he could survive a journey over to Rome to the, the hospital over there. The courts here have always said that that journey in itself is something that Alfie wouldn't survive, and the doctors here at Alder Hay say that as well, that really the options. Alder Hay have always said that Alfie shouldn't be moved from here at all. Yesterday, the High Court judge uh, said that perhaps Alder Hay should look more creatively at things now and consider whether Alfie could in fact be taken to a hospice or perhaps home to the family home in the northwest of the UK but but not over to Rome and so that is now what this argument is about that is what will be aired in court at uh, the Court of Appeal this afternoon.
And uh, Judith, just as I speak to you, uh, the Polish president has tweeted his support for Alfie Evans, uh, saying he must be saved. His brave little body has proved again that the miracle of life can be stronger than death. Perhaps all that's needed is some goodwill on the part of decision makers. That tweet from Poland's president in support uh, of Alfie Evans. Uh, Judith, what reaction has there been to those comments by the High Court judge yesterday saying that some of those uh, around the Evans family haven't really been, been helping the debate? Now, this is a very complicated situation in terms of the support for this family as well because you know I went to the first court hearing several weeks ago in Liverpool at which there were supporters turning up and the, the judge noticed that and said I can see that you're wearing t-shirts which read Alfie's army well we're all on Alfie's side you know Alfie's best interests so what everybody here is fighting for there are lots of differences of opinion about what uh, is in his best interest, but the judge accepted that everybody uh, really was motivated by that. Since that point, though, several weeks ago or months ago, even when these first court hearings began, as you can hear the court, the, the car horns peeping behind me, there have been sizable protests here at the hospital. Uh, there was a situation yesterday where crowds came in and tried to get into the main entrance. And this is a busy hospital with plenty of other very sick children here. And it has caused disruption. The hospital, in fact, today uh, told patients here that there is now a helpline which they've opened so that if there are families who who have appointments here and aren't sure what to do and are concerned about being able to get here, that there is business as usual with extra security and they can phone the helpline for more information if they want. And, and there is uh, this morning, although you, you can't see much of it at the moment behind me, there's a lot of media here, but there's also been a police presence here on site as well. So there is an added complexion to this now. There have been crowds, there have been protests, there's a huge sense of feeling here in Liverpool. And also you've just talked about that, that tweet from the, the Polish uh, Prime Minister. Well, you know, across uh, the world this is a case now which has been picked up by um, by the media and also in last week when Tom Evans Alfie's dad went over to Rome and met the Pope himself the Pope has tweeted support for the family as well uh, it is something which has had a huge social media presence and that in itself has meant that this has stayed I suppose in the public eye continue to attract support but at the same time there is that other point of view which is reflected as well that people are finding it perhaps disruptive and are concerned about the effect that this may be having on patients inside here. Okay, Judith, thank you very much. Judith Moritz outside Alderhey Children's Hospital. And uh, some breaking news to bring you now from the media world. The US media giant Comcast has announced a $22 billion rival bid for Sky. Uh, that is a move, of course, that... Uh, threatens Rupert Murdoch's uh, $11.7 billion deal to attempt a deal to take full control of uh, Sky. You may well know that uh, Rupert Mur Murdoch is trying to do that, but now U.S. media giant Comcast has announced a rival bid for Sky. Uh, they are offering £22 billion, uh, pounds, I beg your pardon, not dollars, I did say dollars before, £22 billion. Pounds, and uh, that is... Uh, another rival bid, of course, alongside Disney. So we'll be talking uh, more about this with Amal Rajan in the next short while. Now, government sources have dismissed claims there were heated exchanges between the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary and Cabinet over immigration policy. It's understood Boris Johnson called for an amnesty for some illegal immigrants and a wider exemption for more Commonwealth citizens. Well, I'm joined from Westminster by our assistant political editor, Norman Smith. So, Norman, uh, morning to you. Tell us more about what these sources are saying. Well, fascinating details emerging of what seems a fairly sharp spat between Boris Johnson and the Prime Minister over this crucial issue of immigration as part of a discussion about the government's response to the Windrush scandal, at which Boris Johnson suggested that the government needed to go further in terms of uh, ensuring Commonwealth citizens could remain in the UK. But on top of that, he also suggested there should be a broader amnesty for illegal immigrants who've been here for some time, perhaps up to 10 or 15 years, some of whom uh, Mr Johnson suggested may have a, 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 a completely clean record. They may have done nothing wrong. They may have paid their uh, taxes. Why not have a broader amnesty for them? Now, that is an idea 
which Mr. Johnson has mooted before. He mooted it when he was uh, home, uh, when he was uh, mayor of London. Mrs. May apparently shot back, well, most voters favour strong immigration controls. But what is so interesting about it, I think, is that this comes just, what, uh, 24 hours after Amber Rudd unveiled a fairly significant package of concessions to try and draw a line under the whole tree, challenging what has been really part and parcel of Mrs May's whole political makeup in recent years, both as Home Secretary and as Prime Minister, namely an aggressive approach to trying to drive down the immigration numbers to the tens of thousands. Here you have Boris Johnson saying to a face, in effect, forget that, we need an illegal amnesty, which of course would mean an awful lot more uh, migrants coming into Cabinet. So a fascinating insight into the tensions between two at the very top of government over this critical issue of immigration, particularly in the, wind in the aftermath of the Windrush saga. Uh, meanwhile, Norman, the Brexit Secretary, David Davis, has been uh, in front of the Brexit Select Committee. What's he been saying? Well, an awful lot of it is very, very uh, technical and detailed. One thing that I think a lot of people are beginning to look at with a degree of interest was David Davis's uh, confirmation that when we have the meaningful vote, the Commons gets to vote on the final deal that Mrs May brings back from Brussels, that will be amendable. In other words, MPs will be able to place amendments to that motion, which could say all sorts of things, such as, why don't we take a bit longer to sort out this deal? Why don't you go back and negotiate a better deal? Why don't we have a second referendum? It opens up a sort of Pandora's box of possibilities. Have a listen to Mr Davis in the committee. Well, the government is unlikely to put a vote to the House, which it does not intend to take properly seriously, yes. So, what does that mean? What I've just said. Yeah. So the, so yes, government... in, in other words, if, if the... If the, uh, if the uh, House rejects the uh, proposed negotiation, then that negotiation will fall. Right. Now, Mr Davis wouldn't be drawn on what happens if the uh, MPs vote to, say, extend the Article 50 process. He wouldn't be drawn on any of those eventualities and said he was confident the government would win that vote. OK, Norman, thank you very much. And I'm joined now from Brussels by our correspondent Adam Fleming to get the view uh, from the rest of the EU. And uh, Adam Giever, Verhofstadt has been talking uh, about possibly a very long period of ratification by the EU member states of any deal, any ultimate Brexit deal, if that deal consists of lots of separate agreements on different issues like trade and security and so on. Yes, yeah, so Guy Verhofstadt is the member of the European Parliament who leads the European Parliament's work on Brexit. And remember, they get a final vote on the final deal, so are an important part of the whole process. Uh, he was giving his regular updates to MEPs about what the latest uh, in the negotiations. And he made a really interesting point that you were just referring to there, in that at the moment, it looks like actually the Brexit deal could be lots of different deals. You'd have your withdrawal agreement, the political declaration about the shape of the future relationship, a free trade agreement, maybe a separate treaty on security, a different agreement on sharing top secret intelligence data, all sorts of things. And he's saying if all of those deals have to be agreed one by one, and some of them will have to be approved by national parliaments and the other 27 member states, then you could be looking at years and years and years for this process rumbling on. He says the solution to that is to create something called an association agreement, which, if you like it, is a big box signed off by the EU that the EN put various other things into, and it's a much easier process to manage. That's kind of medium to long term. The other thing he was talking about in the short term was this priority issue for the European Parliament of citizens' rights, the rights of EU nationals who wish to stay in the UK after Brexit. He and some other MEPs had a meeting with officials from the Home Office yesterday where those officials demonstrated the application process that EU nationals will have to go through to get what's called settled status to stay in the UK. Uh, Mr Verhofstadt uh, left that meeting yesterday saying that he thought lots of work had been done on this and he was quite impressed by it. But he still had some questions. For example, how would vulnerable people be able to use the system if they didn't use the internet? Would individual families, every single family member, have to apply separately? Or could one family do it all, all together? So he's now writing to Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, and to Michelle Barnier to just ask some questions and seek some clarification about those issues on how EU nationals will be treated during the Brexit process.